Infections of the nervous system. In the on this lecture, we're going to talk about uh, the different pathogens uh, and infections that can affect a human's uh, nervous system. And uh, as always, we start briefly with anatomy of the nervous system, uh, its function, and then we we'll continue with. Uh, um, infections or syndromes that can affect a uh, human uh, nervous system and uh, uh, there are main characteristics. Uh, the human uh, nervous system is composed of two main parts. Uh, those are central nervous system or CNS and the peripheral nervous system or PNS. The two main parts of central nervous system will be brain and spinal cord. And the peripheral nervous system is made of nerves uh, that run throughout the body. Uh, our nerves are composed of uh, neurons and uh, supportive tissue. The main function of nerves is to transmit messages uh, from the peripheral organs and tissues uh, to the brain and then uh, transmit uh, signals that coming from the brain to peripheral organs and uh, tissues. So neurons, uh, those are nerve cells and their main function is to transmit nervous impulses. And then they're connected to each other with uh, supportive tissue, we call it neuroglia. So neuroglia connects neurons together. Also, you probably remember from anatomy class that a uh, nervous system cannot regenerate. It means if your patient has uh, brain damage, uh, usually it is permanent. Our central nervous system is protected against infection and injuries. And uh, there are a few layers that protect our central nervous system. And the first layer, those are bones, skull and vertebra. And uh, the next layer, those are meninges, our three membranes. Uh, the most outer layer uh, is called dura matter, and this is the thickest uh, membrane. The most inner layer is called pier matter, and in between there is uh, what we call arachnoid. There's a space between arachnoid and pier matter, and uh, we call it subarachnoid space. Uh, you probably remember that cerebrospinal uh, fluid is actually made in a subarachnoid space. So, what is it, cerebrospinal fluid? It's a clear liquid. Uh, it circulates around brain and spinal cord, and of course, uh, the main function of cerebrospinal fluid will be protection, protection from injury. Um, also, we use uh, uh, cerebrospinal fluid to diagnose certain infections, uh, for example, meningitis, and to do so, we perform a procedure we call a spinal tap, and um, we usually perform it at the level of uh, L5. So basically, if our patient has uh, meningitis, uh, we expect to see uh, increased protein levels in the subarachnoid uh, fluid, cerebrospinal fluid, uh, increased glucose uh, levels in uh, cerebrospinal fluid, and also we will be able to find blood in the cerebrospinal fluid of those patients. The next layer of protection of our central nervous system is what we call blood-brain barrier. Uh, blood-brain barrier, it is actually the thickened outer layers of the capillaries that supply our central nervous system. Uh, blood-brain barrier is uh, per uh, permanent uh, excuse me, permeable for uh, essential molecules, for example, oxygen, uh, carbon dioxide, uh, certain nutrients, but it is not uh, permeable for toxins and pathogens. Unfortunately, it's not very permeable for uh, antibacterial, uh, and bacterial drugs that we use to treat uh, infections, bacterial infections of central nervous system. 
Um, so that explains why if our patient has, let's say, bacterial meningitis, we have to increase doses of antibacterial drugs in order to make sure that those drugs reach the source of infection. Uh, the good news, though, is uh, if blood-brain barrier uh, gets infected, it becomes more permeable for medication. So on this lecture, uh, we're going to talk about uh, four groups of uh, different kinds, uh, kind of infections uh, that uh, will affect uh, the human nervous system. The first syndrome is called meningitis. It means uh, meninges will be infected and uh, inflammation will occur in this area. The main symptoms of meningitis will be high fever, severe headache, stiffness of the neck, and guys, you have to remember that stiffness of the neck, it's a rigidity of the neck, it is a very specific symptom for bacterial meningitis uh, most of the times. But uh, in general, meningitis, uh, uh, what kind of pathogen can, uh, pathogens can cause it? Uh, it can be caused by bacteria, as I said. It also can be caused by uh, viruses, and it also can be caused by fungi. It can uh, have fungal origin. The next group, uh, this will call encephalitis. Encephalitis means infection or inflammation of the brain. Uh, you have to remember that encephalitis as an infection is not very easy to diagnose because there are no specific symptoms for encephalitis and usually symptoms or signs uh, depend on what part of the brain is actually affected or damaged. Encephalitis can be caused by uh, viruses, can be caused by protozoa and the prions. Next group, we call it myelitis. It means spinal cord will be affected. Of course, the main uh, uh, symptom of uh, this disorder or this infection will be paralysis uh, because spinal cord is affected. And as an example of myelitis, we're going to talk about polio, uh, myelitis caused by polio virus. And the last group of infections, uh, this is what we call neurotoxin caused uh, infections. And uh, in this case, uh, uh, these infections can cause paralysis, either rigid paralysis or flaccid paralysis. <clears throat> and today we're going to talk about Clostridium tetani and the Clostridium botulinum. And uh, we start with uh, bacterial meningitis. Uh, you have to remember that bacterial meningitis is uh, the most dangerous uh, type of meningitis uh, because it can be a um, life-threatening infection. So it requires immediate antibacterial treatment. So what is it, bacterial meningitis? Uh, it's uh, inflammation of uh, meninges and uh, uh, the main symptoms of bacterial meningitis will be sudden high fever. Uh, severe, uh, severe headaches and the rigidity of the neck or stiffness of the neck. The first bacterium that can cause uh, bacterial meningitis is Neisseria meningitis. It is a gram negative diplococcus. It is uh, uh, requires uh, chocolate media for growth and uh, besides uh, chocolate media, it has second requirement for growth. It is 5 to 10 percent of uh, CO2 or we call it reduced oxygen. It has adhesions that it uses for attachment and uh, uh, the very invasive strains actually have also capsule in their structure, uh, structure. and that explains why they are so uh, resistant, so stable. Nicenia meningitis causes what we call meningococcal meningitis and uh, the source of infection will be an infected individual or asymptomatic uh, carrier. Meningococcal meningitis is transmitted by uh, respiratory droplets 
And the main symptoms of infection uh, will be uh, besides uh, high fever, severe headaches, um, stiff neck. Uh, there will be one more symptom very specific for this type of meningitis. Uh, this is what we call petechiae on the skin. Those are small purplish spots and usually you can uh, see them on the surface of the skin of uh, trunk of the patient in the belly area. Um, Patients develop this symptom because um, Neisseria meningitis has the ability to damage capillaries of the skin. As a result, patients develop uh, petechia on the skin. Usually, uh, the outbreaks of uh, meningococcal meningitis uh, we have uh, when uh, we have a lot of people crowded together, uh, for example, uh, students in dormitory or military. And uh, also, it can affect immunocompromised patients, for example, children, young children, and uh, elderly patients. For the treatment, we're going to use antibiotics, for example, penicillin G can be a drug of choice, and the vaccine is available today. next bacterium that also can cause meningitis is Haemophilus influenza. Uh, guys, uh, Haemophilus influenza is a gram-negative bacillus and uh, uh, don't get confused with the name of this bacterium. Uh, it's called Haemophilus influenza because long time ago, ago when we discovered this bacterium we believed that it could cause influenza. Today we know it doesn't but still using that name. So anyway, Haemophilus influenza is a gram-negative bacillus. It has capsule and that explains why it can be so aggressive and cause a meningitis. Uh, Haemophilus influenza usually uh, causes um, infections in children, young children. Uh, why not adults? Uh, because most adults are actually seropositive to Haemophilus influenza means we have immunity developed. Uh, the source of infection will be infected individual or asymptomatic carrier. And uh, the symptoms of uh, this type of meningitis will be the same, uh, severe headaches, high fever, and uh, rigid neck. Next bacterium that can cause meningitis is Streptococcus pneumonia. Uh, Streptococcus pneumonia causes what we call pneumococcal meningitis. Why do we call it pneumococcal? Because uh, pneumococcus is actually is the old name that we used um, used to use uh, to for Streptococcus pneumonia. Streptococcus pneumonia is gram positive diplococcus. And guys, even though we call it caucus, a round cell, but actually the cells of strep pneumonia are not round. They have oval shape or we call it lancet shape. Also, what you have to remember is uh, even though uh, it is strep, and you remember that most straps are gram-positive coccyne chains, and as you see, streptococcus pneumonia is gram-positive diplococcus. It also can form short chains. But for your exams, you specifically have to remember that streptococcus pneumonia is gram-positive diplococcus. Uh, streptococcus pneumonia is very aggressive pathogen because it has thick mucoid capsule. And uh, usually it causes a secondary meningitis uh, because uh, the first source of infection usually is located in the ears of the patient or sinuses. And from there, uh, infection can move uh, to the brain of the patient and affect meninges. Vaccine is available today. And the last uh, bacterium that can cause uh, bacterial meningitis is E. coli. Uh, it is gram-negative bacillus and uh, we uh, use this semester E. coli as an example of coliform, uh, which is a part of normal biota in a human uh, GI tract. But also there are some pathogenic strains of E. coli and they are able to cause meningitis. Uh, e. coli causes only uh, about 5% of bacterial meningitis and usually uh, it affects newborns and patients who have undergone neurosurgery.